My real name is Elizabeth Irene Kennedy de Policelli, and everybody calls me Betty. I was born in Argentina, and I came to Canada with my husband and my children because my husband was invited by the Mennonite Church to come and start the, the Mennonite Near Life Center. My husband and I were students at the Mennonite Seminary, AMBS, in Elkhart, Indiana, in the United States. And we, my husband received a call from uh, a man from the mission board who asked him if he would be willing to come and study the situation of what was happening with all the Latin American refugees that were coming from the civil wars in mostly Central America, but also there had been a lot from Chile and other parts of South America. So he came for a summer. He was here for about five months. He did a feasibility study and he wrote a proposal as to how the, the Mennonite uh, Mission Board would be able to work with uh, the refugees. Adolfo had not, but a lot of knowledge about all of the countries of Latin America. He had worked for the International Bible Society and he'd had to visit all of the countries uh, of Latin America. He had studied sociology and, and he was also, uh, had studied theology. So he, these things had come together for him. So he could analyze the society and what the problems were in the society. When we were still living in Argentina, he came back from one of his trips in Central America and he said to me, we're living on the edge of a volcano and that volcano is going to erupt at any moment. And shortly after that, the, the civil wars in Central America started. So when he presented his proposal, even the name, New Life Center, it didn't exist, but even the name was in the proposal. And then they asked him, please come and implement this program that you have designed for us. So we came in August of 1983 in a truck. We didn't have a car. We came in a moving van with our furniture. But we came in and we lived at the house at 47 Afton on the west end of Toronto for the first year and a half. And there we started the work with refugees. After a year and a half, we moved to 833 Coxwell, which was a larger, more spacious house. And there it had, there were two floors. The lower floor was the New Life Center and the meeting room uh, for social events. And the top floor was where we lived. Uh, and we were there two and a half years, and then that one was also sold. And the New Life Center moved to 2085 Danforth. Um, that, that was an office with, uh, on top of a bank on the second floor, and just half a block from the subway station, so it was very accessible. Before we had moved into the Danforth office, St. Clair O'Connor Community, which is a Mennonite project at, at St. Clair and O'Connor, uh, they had offered us a very large unit that they could not rent. And so we started a reception house there. And many of the people that were arriving were living in that reception house. They could stay there until they found a house. The first man who arrived, it was about this time of the year, there was still snow on the ground. And he, we were driving him from the airport and he was looking at the trees and he said, where have I come to live? All the trees are dead. <laughs> <laughs> he had never been in a country where there was snow. So he was very delighted when April and May came along and he saw the trees coming alive. 
His name was Don Francisco. And Don Francisco was very limited as to what he could do. He, he could find an address. He, he had never had much schooling and he didn't understand the system. So for about a month, Adolfo went everywhere with Don Francisco, maybe even more than a month, because he wanted to learn at the same time as translate for Don Francisco. So Don Francisco needed a buddy because this was so different to, to the world he knew. And so Adolfo learned about the, the court system, he learned ab about the welfare system, he learned uh, about the schooling that was available. He learned everything by just walking with Don Francisco. And that gave, gave him the tools that he needed to then be able to go to the police, for example. He was called to, to, to the police so that he could explain why people would run away from the police. There is a park in, in Toronto that's called the Sunken Park, which is just across from one, where one of the refugee houses was. And the people would be sitting there, and if they saw a police, they would get up and run. And so the police would run after them. He, if he's running away from me, it's because he's done something. And Adolfo had to teach the police that, no, they, it's not running away from you. They're running away from what happened to them in El Salvador. And, and there was a doctor who, who met us and she had just come back from Australia. And as soon as she saw what we were doing, she said, I'm going to learn Spanish. I want to work with the, with the refugees. So she did it. She learned Spanish and she was able to work. So there were, there were these professionals that just came around and helped. And several lawyers and other, other um, needs that were in the schools, you know, and, and a lot of counseling. So we had an art therapist that, that came and worked with us. And they would do art therapy. Um, and I, I was amazed at what she would be able to, to find out. She would say, today only use red and paint a bridge. So then they would paint a bridge and, the, and she would always tell them, don't worry about what the bridge looks like. You don't have to be an artist. This is, we're getting into the inside. And so then she would ask them, where is the bridge going? And what is on the other side of the bridge? And they would begin to tell their story of what had happened to them. Well, when we started, it was just the two of us. So I could offer a translation which was necessary, the people would arrive and they would, they would be housed on the West End, and we were living on the West End, in a building, and they would lock themselves in their apartment, and the next, next door there was someone from Bangladesh, or someone from Haiti, and they didn't, couldn't communicate among themselves, uh, and they, they were scared. So we could go there, we could talk to them, and we could ask them what, what appointments they had, and then we could go with them and translate. So that's how we started. And, and then other young people that volunteered their time with us would help. There, there, would be, there was a, a wonderful family that all of the five members of the family, they all helped. They spoke Spanish and they spoke English. And so there would be um, organizing who could go where to translate. Uh, we would translate for manpower, it was called at that time. Or we would translate at the schools, or we would translate at the hospitals. And that's how we got to know people. And they became part of our life, and, and our home became a base where the New Life Centre operated, but also it became a place where people could come together. There would be, there was a, a wonderful family that all of the five members of the family, they all helped. They spoke Spanish and they spoke English. And so there would be um, organizing who could go where to translate. 
and then the father of that family, the, he started the, the newsletter. Uh, and so we got to know him and his wife and his children. But there, there was um, um, some issues, difficult issues. And so he took some courses on how to control violence. And then the New Life Center employed him so he would teach other men not to not to be violent, to stop abuse and, and all of those. And when we had a newsletter, we could let other people know what, what we were doing. And there was a group that was doing the same kind of work in Kitchener. The service was for everybody. And people that came to the church because they thought that that way they would get better service. Adolfo was always very clear, and he would say to them, you don't need to come to the church to receive our services. If you come to church, you come because you're looking for what God wants to give you. But don't come because that, that is a door for you to receive our services. You're welcome. There was one person who had been a torturer that, that Adolfo worked with for many, many years. And he was also a victim. Some places wouldn't receive him. But this man, his mother had died when he was born. And uh, when his father came back from the cemetery um, after burying his wife, he had two older children and this baby. The father committed suicide. He didn't know what to do with the three children. So the, this baby was given up to adoption. And the, the, he was adopted by a family that told him that the best thing he could do was serve the army, serve his country in the army. So he went to the army and because he had no family, he was hand-picked and trained to be a torturer. And he was as much a victim as the people that were victimized. Maria Elena was one of the first refugees that I worked with to help her be able to bring her children that were in an orphanage in El Salvador. I went to Manpower, it was called at that point, and I was translating for the people that had just arrived. And she had just arrived. She had, her husband had died. She lived in the rural area. She had never been able to go to school, so she hadn't learned how to read and write. She had survived in the United States for several, for several years, trying to make money to send back to the orphanage where her four children were but she couldn't bring her children to the United States. So she heard that if she was accepted in Canada, they would help her bring her children. So we did all of the legwork and the paperwork so as to be able to bring her children when she arrived. And the wonderful day in which the four children came, they, had, they didn't have any warm clothes and it was winter time in Canada. So we pulled out all the clothes we could find so as to be able to give them some warm clothes. And we've been friends ever since. This is the, the little boy who lived next door. He moved in with his mother. Yeah, yeah. He was sponsored by the Mennonite church, this English speaking church here. Um, and he had never had a wheelchair. He couldn't walk. He, was, he had spina bifida. And so he could only drag himself on the floor and his mother could carry him. And when he came to Canada, uh, Mario took care of him in this house next door. He was the settlement worker, Mario Bianchi. He was the settlement worker and he helped the mother and the child. And through the programs that Canada has to offer, he was given a wheelchair and he was it's, it made his life totally different. He's a very joyful little, uh -huh. little boy. Well, 
Now he's in his 20s. He's one of the champions. He's one of the champions of the Ontario Disability um, Basketball. And the first person we were able to hire was a Salvadorian. And that was a woman in the Mennonite Church in Mississauga. And she said, I'm going to give you a donation of $5,000 so that you can hire your first uh, assistant. And so we did, thanks to that donation. And lots of things happened like that from donations that people would give. And this man began to work with finding housing because it was, it's not as difficult as now, but it was still very difficult to find housing in those years, 83, 84, 85. There was um, a, a problem with the, the availability. And um, thanks to this man, the, the government, immigration department, called Adolfo. And they, they said, we've seen what you're doing, and we would like to support you, so you can hire another person, and we'll pay for both of them, the one that's already working and the other one. So then we had two people from El Salvador working with us. And then we became, and the Mennonite New Life Center was, was then um, an, recognized as an independent NGO and we had our own uh, number for tax purposes. We need more room. That was the church. Yeah, yeah. The New Life Center needs more room. Yeah. And the Mennonite New Life, the church, mm -hmm. they need more room. Mm -hmm. So they tore down the building and they started building here, this building. Oh, this place. This building. Oh, yeah. And these are all when they were tearing down. Yeah, the staff, staff. Uh, tearing down and building up. When we moved here, yeah. then we were given a grant uh -huh. uh, to help build the building. Uh -huh. And so the New Life Center had part of the first floor and the second floor. Mm -hmm. And the New Life Church had the third floor. And the English Church had the big, big church in the front of the first floor uh -huh. and all the basement. Oh. But we could all share. Uh -huh. So when during the week when the church isn't yeah, there, yeah, yeah. They, we, can, we could have many classes. So uh -huh. we had Link and we had a daycare and we had a program for seniors. And we, we had a lot of tutoring, uh, people that would help. We had an art therapist that came to help people to work through all their emotions. You know, refugees, you know what it's like. I wanted to study spiritual direction. So we, we went to Regis College to do that. And um, when we returned, there's nothing like leaving a, a, a vacuum uh, the people that had taken over both the church and the center, there, there was a lot of fluctuation um, and disintegration while, uh, when we came back. And the, the interesting thing was, if I hadn't studied what I went to study, I wouldn't have known how, well, I didn't know a lot of the time, how to react to all the things that happened after we tried to come back. The vision that my, my husband had for the center was that it would be a place that people would be able to come and receive what they needed uh, in the different aspects of their adjustment in, in Canada. And one of the areas that is sometimes neglected is the area of, of healing from your own trauma. So he, he would suggest to the English teachers that they would teach that one of the first things they needed to help the, the students learn to say is to express their grief. 
to express their pain, to not keep it bottled up inside because you can try and learn English and nothing goes in because there's so much pain inside. And so he would always encourage the newcomers to go through their own grief and talk about it. Don't, don't hide it. the work of healing that is part of the process that the New Life Center staff is offering. They offer a therapy of compassion. Yeah, I think that's a very wonderful service that the staff are offering newcomers. A therapy that will put them in touch with their heart and and put them in touch with, with the healing. I know what the center has to offer, mm -hmm. so I can refer people. I can, the, this, you know, psychologists and counselors and therapists, it's difficult to find through OHIP. You, you can't get them. So, um, I can refer people and I can tell professionals, doctors who, who want to refer somebody and don't know where to send them, I tell them, send them to the New Life Center and they can ask for a counselor in Spanish. And now they have a, a counselor that speaks Ukrainian, so that's wonderful. Try and live one day at a time. Don't be anxious about what's going to happen a month from now. Just try and live this day as best you can. Because our minds play tricks on us. And when things get complicated, we tend to look down the road and see very dark futures. But you never know. <laughs>